I advise the European Union. We have established a third industrial revolution game plan. It's made up of four pillar infrastructure, endorsed by the European Parliament in 2007. We're moving now across the 27 member states. And maybe it'd be interesting here for an American audience. Maybe if some of you know President Obama or people in Congress, you can you know, give them a heads up on this. Four pillars. The EU has committed itself to 20% renewable energy by 2020. That's a third of the electricity of Europe from the Irish Sea to the doorsteps of Russia, way ahead of everybody else. Pillar two, buildings. Buildings are the main cause of CO2. They're also the solution. What we envision in the EU is every single existing building converted to a power plant in the next 25 years. Every home, office, factory, technology park, every building, your own power plant. So you can collect your own energy on site, the sun on the roof, the wind on the walls, the heat under the ground, etc. Pillar three, the EU has committed itself to eight billion euro rollout of public-private funds to store these energies in the form of hydrogen because the sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing. They're intermittent energy, so you have to have a storage, hydrogen. Then pillar four, that's where this distributed communication revolution I talked about converges with the new distributed energies to create a third industrial revolution. We're going to use the same exact technology that created the internet. It's actually identical. Transform the power grids of Europe, America, Asia, all of the continents to intergrids that act exactly like the internet. So that when millions and millions and millions of buildings are producing just a little bit of their own energy on site, renewable distributed energy, stored in hydrogen like we store digital in media, media and digital, excuse me, and then shared across smart grids that move across regions and entire continents. This is what we're laying down across the EU. This is a third industrial revolution. This is actually power to the people. We overused it in 1968. But frankly, the younger generation doesn't know about it, so we can bring the term back. <laughs> this third industrial revolution allows us to rethink our relationship to each other because when everybody's responsible for one small swath of the biosphere where we live, and in that small swath of the biosphere, we harness the renewable energies that bathe the planet and then share it with others across regions and continents, then we've taken the ultimate responsibility and that each of us is responsible to steward the energy that bathes this planet and sustains the life of everybody. That takes us to the edge, I think, of biosphere consciousness. I believe that this third industrial revolution comes with an, the ultimate, I guess I would call it the ultimate right. We've been ensconcing human and social rights now for a long time since World War II and our declarations at the UN. But I think there's a fundamental right that comes to the fore as we move to a third industrial revolution and a biosphere age. And that is that every human being, every single human being, here today and not yet born, and every single creature here today and not yet born, our fellow creatures, each one has a fundamental right to their fair share of the energy that bathes the earth and sustains all of life. Make sense? We human beings are one half of one percent of the animal biomass on earth. That's all we are. We're now using 24 percent of all the photosynthesis that bathes this earth. It's simply unsustainable. We, you know this and I know this. We know this in our heart. We don't need the statistics to see what's happening. Can we make this leap to biosphere consciousness? Well, look, let's get down to reality. 50% of the human race, the wealthy consumers, we're living high up on the chain. Unsustainably, I'm part of this process, and uh, we, are, we have a very heavy carbon footprint. The bottom 40% of the human race tonight is making $2 a day or less. They have a very light carbon footprint, but they're barely able to eke out a survival. So the real question is, if we want to move from geopolitics to biosphere politics, how do we make sure that the wealthiest on the planet establish a new dream that's based not so much just on individual opportunity to succeed, the old American dream, but quality of life? So that the bottom 40% of the human race can get up to the threshold. Well, how do we do this? I think we have to revisit the idea of what makes people happy. 
And I've been reading all these happiness studies in, in the last few years. It's fascinating <laughs> and eye-opening and revealing. You know, our Enlightenment philosophers said that the more wealth you acquire, the more happy you become. Because you become an island to yourself and you're free. You have autonomy and mobility. That's why we love the automobile. But the happiness studies say that if you're really poor and you're barely able to survive, you have very few emotional and empathic reserves to think about the polar bears and the penguins on the far sides of the earth. <laughs> but as you get more wealth, you get happier. They then say there's a threshold, however, where the basic comforts of life are met. That's the peak. And as we get wealthier after the threshold of comforts are met, each increment of wealth makes us a little bit less happier. And then we finally reach a point where we actually become more unhappy because our possessions end up possessing us. So we have to imagine a society that's complex, that's integrated, that stewards the planet, and a society in which the gap between the haves and the have-nots has been narrowed. And so when haves tax themselves, they find that the loss of income in taxing themselves for the good of the whole community does not depreciate their happiness as much as it increases the happiness of those that then are brought up. Do you follow me? So if we can meet at that threshold, it's a new dream. It's not individual opportunity to succeed. That's a good dream. But we need a broader dream, and that is the quality of life. If we are empathic beings, I mean, if that's who we really are, and we seek affection and intimacy and connection and companionship, and all these other drives are secondary, aggression and violence, because we didn't get what we really need in life, then it seems to me if we create a quality of life dream, the poor can get up to the threshold of comfort. We can learn to live more sustainably. It's difficult. Listen, I'm not Mother Teresa. It's difficult for me. Uh, uh, it's easy to talk about it. It's a lot harder to walk with it, uh, I can tell you personally. But if we can do that, we may have a shot to get to biosphere consciousness in less than a generation. And I don't think we have more than a generation. And again, I don't think there's a plan B. Let me leave you with some hopeful signs. People say, well, where are the signs? How do we know this is going to happen? Consciousness can change. Sometimes just little inventions change consciousness. I'll give you an example. Some of you have traveled to Venice, and you've gone uh, to uh, Murano, where they make glass. Well, in the 14th century, they began producing mirrors, mass production in glass. Now, this is a, a breakthrough we don't think about. Before that time, people actually didn't get a good idea of themselves. You could see yourself in a pond of water, whoa, there it goes. Or in a piece of metal, not too good. So people didn't actually spend much time on looking at themselves. When they began to reproduce mirrors, they actually uh, provided them with the books when you got the first printed books. And people started, it was a new pastime, looking at themselves. And it wasn't only because they thought, wow, look at me. It was really interesting to them. Self-reflection. Mirrors reflect. We became self-reflective and introspective. We dug down deep and we created more of a sense of our individual identity. By becoming more of a self, we can empathize more with another. And this is what breaks that logjam bet between right and left, where many conservatives say, oh, empathy is just a code for liberalism. And, and many liberals say, well, you just care about individuals. Well, in fact, you have to have a well-developed sense of selfhood in order to existentially feel another person's plight and condition and begin to be sensitive to them. I should say this third industrial revolution breaks the old right-left scheme in a very fundamental way. Uh, the new divide is generational, be clear. It's not right-left. It's between those who think in the old-fashioned, centralized, patriarchal, top-down way of organizing the world that the, the great hydraulic civilizations created in the first and second industrial revolution and the parenting models and the education models and the business models that go with it versus a younger generation growing up on the third industrial revolution, connective technologies, communication energy, they think open source. They're thinking commons. They're engaged in collaborative social spaces and hopefully collaborative energy spaces. It's a different frame of reference. This was a portion of a Book TV program. You can view the entire program and many other Book TV programs online. Go to booktv.org, type the name of the author or book into the search area in the upper left-hand corner of the page. Select the Watch link. Now you can view the entire program. 
You might also explore the Recently on Book TV box or the Featured Video box to find recent and featured programs.